Senator Chang is a Hawaii State Senator serving East Honolulu in Senate District 9. He also serves as a Hawaii State Senate Housing Committee Chair. Senator, when you're ready. Good morning, everyone, and aloha. It's great to be with everyone virtually in our conference today. But I wanted to start today with an image. Our housing situation is extremely serious. We're in a crisis right now, and our community is on life support. So I'm not here to waste your time with Band-Aids or Neosporin. We're here to talk about major surgery. It has to be a very specific type of surgery though, because some of the solutions will not work or they will cause further problems down the road. And this is the image that I want us all to have in our brains as we continue to talk about the housing shortage. Let me elaborate a little bit more about what I mean. In the three years since 2018 that I began my work as housing chair in the Hawaii State Senate, the housing shortage in Hawaii has not abated, it has not moderated, it has gotten much more severe. I'm sorry to say that all of our efforts to this date have failed, have utterly failed. Depending on which data you look at now, three out of the four counties of Hawaii have $1 million median single family home prices on Kauai, one of the rural neighbor island counties, we have an astonishing median home price of $1.3275 million. And all four counties have now been setting record monthly median home prices now for several months in a row in 2021. This despite the worst economic crisis in generations and the highest unemployment rate in the United States here in Hawaii. The cause of this is simple. It is a structural undersupply issue. Every year on average, public schools in Hawaii graduate about 11,000 people like these happy graduates a few years ago from Hilo High School. That's not, of course, even counting the private school graduates of Hawaii. Every year on average, we produce about 2000 housing units. So it does not matter if all 11,000 high school graduates are billionaires, and it does not matter if all 2000 housing units are completely free. What we are telling our young people is, now that you're an adult, you have to leave, you cannot come back. This is not your home and will never be your home again because we have made the decision that you will never have a home in Hawaii. We have been telling this to our young people for decades now. And as a result, we've hit that tipping point. For the last four straight years, Hawaii has now been in a state of population decline. Like the Rust Belt, like other jurisdictions around the world that have population decline, this is not a good thing. This is a bad thing. As you can see, the trend is accelerating. And I believe as the pandemic uh, continues in 2021, this trend will only continue. So how do we reverse this trend? How do we actually solve the housing shortage? Well, there's only one answer. And that answer is to start building enough housing to meet demand. Here's one of many such studies that cites the figure of 64,700 to 66,000 housing units as a number that Hawaii needs to build in a 10 year period. And unfortunately, we're over halfway through the 2015 to 2025 period, and we have fallen drastically short of this amount. But we have to ask ourselves, how will this housing actually get built and where will it get built? For decades, for generations in Hawaii, we've built using single family suburban sprawl. And so here we have about 10 years worth of housing supply and these blue area here is not a hypothetical area where housing can go. This is a real area 
This is 67,500 real households in the Aea de Capule and Macaquilo area. And if you're not familiar with this area in central and west Oahu, um, this is what it looks like. This is what Pearl City looks like. Very residential, very much a single family suburban neighborhood. This is the Eva by Gentry neighborhood. There is some multifamily, but again, it's very much a typical American suburban model. And here's Kapole. Again, here there might be some townhouses, but this is a fairly low density model. It's not hard to see that if we continue to build in this fashion, after just a couple of decades, we'll start expanding that footprint of urban development of, on Oahu. We can build enough housing for a while at low density. At the density of the community that I live in, um, about four homes per acre, we would need to pave over 16,875 acres of undeveloped land every single decade. Eight, uh, sorry, 16,875 acres every single decade. It's not hard to see that as the decades go by, pretty soon the entire land area of Oahu will be covered with residential development, much like this city, the capital of the island nation of the Maldives, Malé. Now, is this what we want in Hawaii? I don't know about you, but as for me, I treasure the agricultural land, like the pineapple fields in Haleiwa, the majestic vistas of the Waianae Range in the western part of this island. Our single family neighborhoods, like Lanikai, that offer an unsurpassed lifestyle and access to recreational opportunities like the beach and to the mountains. We have communities like Kaneohe that offer an unparalleled view of some of the most spectacular scenery in the world. And that's why for decades, for generations, new development attracts a lot of opposition. And while of course the merits of each individual proposal differ, on the whole, I agree with these folks. I think we should keep the country country. That's what makes Hawaii special. Our natural environment, our endangered species, our unique way of life all stem from the lands that we don't develop. So how do we keep our island mostly green, mostly natural? How do we limit our human footprint to as small a footprint as possible? Well, the answer is the first rule that I'm gonna talk about today, and that is high density. This of course is a photograph from the city of Hong Kong. And when most people think of Hong Kong, I think that this is probably what they imagine, a super dense concrete jungle, Blade Runner type environment, towers stretching to the sky, very little open space and uh, very, very cramped living conditions. And that's all true. But here's a side of Hong Kong that maybe we don't think about. This is the entire territory of Hong Kong. And as you can see, there is a lot of urbanism in the Kowloon Peninsula on the north side of Hong Kong Island. But even the majority of Hong Kong Island, which is the city center of Hong Kong, is green and undeveloped. Most of the new territories, Lantau Island, is undeveloped. Indeed, this is probably the greenest and least developed area of the entire so-called Greater Bay Area that includes communities like Shenzhen, Dongguan, and Guangzhou. Hong Kong, by densifying its city center, has been able to keep the vast majority of its land undeveloped. Now, 
people have been talking about island communities, communities without a lot of land like Oahu, and it's certainly true that Oahu is a small island. But as you can see from this diagram, Hong Kong is actually smaller than the island of Oahu, but it has over seven times the population. Only about 24% of Hong Kong is developed land. About three quarters of Hong Kong is undeveloped, including country parks, agriculture, and other undeveloped land. And it turns out that on the island of Oahu, we have about the same, just a little bit more developed land than Hong Kong does by proportion of our total land, 25.7% compared to 24.3%. But like, uh, like Hong Kong, Oahu keeps about three quarters of its land undeveloped. That is special. And we should try to keep it that way. Indeed, in Honolulu, there are areas where we do have significant density. This might be an area that's familiar to many of you. This is the Don Quixote Ala Moana area. And in this area, existing residential buildings have achieved a density of about 241 units per acre. This is another area that might be familiar to those who have been to Honolulu. This is the Mauka Chinatown area where buildings like Honolulu Tower, Capitol Place are, and this has a density of 247 dwelling units per acre. So let me take, let's take this representative amount of density at 250 units per acre, and let's illustrate that a little bit further. So remember, this is our 67,500 existing households with a low, mostly single family level of density. If we were to build 67,500 units at 250 units per acre. This is all the land that we would need, which is smaller than the Eva by Gentry neighborhood. If we were to build in the vein of Hong Kong's more recent housing developments, like this housing estate, at a density of 585 units per acre, then this is all the land that we would need. So again, the higher density we build, the less land that we would need. In past housing conferences, I've mentioned state-owned lands near rail stations. And here are just a few of the representative examples, including Aloha Stadium, including the OCCC prison, both of which are already slated for redevelopment. By identifying these seven parcels of land, which are already along the rail line, and building them at 250 units per acre, this is the amount of land that we would need. From this diagram, it's easy to see that decades, even centuries worth of housing supply could be limited to our existing urban core. We would never need to touch one inch of agricultural or conservation land or even any existing residential neighborhoods, whether they are low density, high density, or otherwise. All of this could be achieved on state-owned lands such as Aloha Stadium that do not have residences on them. So again, this could be 10 years worth of housing supply, or this could be 10 years worth of housing supply. The choice is yours. Now, density is not the only rule to make a successful community. Let's get to the three other rules. Um, people tend to have a lot of negative associations with density. People tend to think of crime, poverty, urban heat islands, congestion, traffic, carbon and pollutant emissions from that car traffic, unhealthful conditions generally. And people tend to have the immediate reaction that we need more open space and green space in our urban environments to try to mitigate some of those issues. The reality is the data over centuries and over millennia tell a different story. The revealed preference of the human experience is that to make a successful community, what we really need are these four rules as a whole. Not just high density, but also ground floor retail, no setbacks, which is the strip of space between a sidewalk and a building 
or between a road and a building. And finally, narrow streets and sidewalks. Now this is highly counterintuitive. So I'm gonna to try to illustrate exactly what I mean with some examples around the world of this type of urbanism in action. And so here we have the Barry Gothique neighborhood of Barcelona, Spain, extremely popular neighborhood. This is the famous Greenwich Village neighborhood of Manhattan in New York City. Here we have the Ginza district of Tokyo. And finally, this is the north end of Boston. So here we have four different communities from four very different locations around the world, but they all follow these four principles, high density, ground floor retail, no setbacks, narrow streets and sidewalks. And not only are they some of the world's most popular, successful, thriving neighborhoods, for both local residents and visitors alike. They are also some of the most sustainable and healthy environments for people in the world. We'll see further benefits like quality of life, long lifespans, economic prosperity, cultural vitality, public safety, very little car usage, and low carbon impact per person. Individuals in these environments have that magical real estate amenity, a five minute walk to everything, to every conceivable public service, a bank, a post office, a grocery store, a pharmacist, and public transportation within a five minute walk. And are we cherry picking here? Well, to an extent we are, but we see this over and over again. Here we see neighborhoods like Cairo, Taipei, Paris and Venice, all following the same principles. We see neighborhoods like Istanbul, Seoul, and Lisbon, all following the exact same principles. When you visit neighborhoods like this, and now we're gonna visit some of these neighborhoods at the ground level, do you really say to yourself, what we really need around here is a strip of grass between the building and the road? No, that's not what we say here. Um, when we visit neighborhoods like San Miguel de Allende in Mexico or Mykonos in Greece, this is the Shinjuku neighborhood of Tokyo. Again, we have Barcelona, a streetscape the famous Portobello Road Market in Notting Hill in London. This is a traditional neighborhood in Shanghai named Tianzifang. Here's a famous neighborhood in Morocco. And finally, this is a neighborhood that has been so beautiful for the centuries that this is where, you know, I just got married and this is where I would love, I would dream of honeymooning. We love narrow streets and sidewalks. We love the ground floor retail. We love the high density, no setback environment. These are all some of the most desirable neighborhoods in the world. They are beautiful, they are pleasant, they are spectacular. And I believe that this is the template that we should be thinking about when we think about high density, high quality neighborhoods. Again, all of these neighborhoods follow those four rules of urban density. But perhaps no community in the world expresses these four principles as much as Hong Kong. This is a street that I lived on when I was a toddler for one year. If you see this shop with the red sign on the right hand side, that's a one ton shop. I don't remember ever having eaten there. But just looking at it, I can tell that's going to be the best one ton I've ever had in my life. Here's some more shots. You can see how you can imagine how slowly these vehicles are moving. People are not really using these streets for car transportation. As you can see, 
people are walking on those streets. Pedestrians are freely walking amongst the cars on these streets. Every service, every conceivable service that you would need is within a five minute walk. I also wanna point out that these storefronts are not gentrified. You know, these neighborhoods are not, you know, tourist Disneylands. These are real working class neighborhoods for real families. And I know that because a lot of my relatives live in these areas. And as you can see from the storefronts, we're not talking about Prada and Gucci here. We're talking about small mom and pop shops. In fact, it's very hard to see even one chain store in any of these storefronts. What you also see here, these are not Starkitect designed sculptures in the sky. These are not swooping Pritzker Prize winning geometric forms. These buildings are not human scaled. They're not beautiful six story buildings like the historic hearts of many uh, European cities. These are 20 or 30 story towers that were cheaply designed, cheaply built and cheaply maintained for decades, 30, 40, 50 years. These buildings would never make the cover of the annual report of a big developer like a Brookfield or a DR Horton or a Forest City. But these buildings are some of the most valuable, some of the most desirable in the entire world. Let's just take a look at some numbers. Here's the median cost of a home per square foot in various cities around the world. And as you can see, Hong Kong leads the pack. Indeed, in Hong Kong, if you had $1 million to buy a home, that will buy only on average about 363 square feet of home, or the size of about two and a half parking stalls. Obviously, Hong Kong has a severe housing shortage, and obviously, this housing is out of reach to most people. I'm not saying it's a good thing that housing is so expensive in Hong Kong, quite the opposite. But I think what this can irrefutably illustrate is this point. In Hawaii, it's easy to understand why people will pay big bucks for housing. But the fact that people are willing to pay so much money to live in old, poorly maintained towers is not at all intuitive. Why is it that these people are willing to pay so much money for such substandard housing conditions when they could easily relocate to a Shanghai or a South Carolina? It's because this housing is really desirable. People really love that convenience of that five minute walk to everything. We saw all that retail space at the ground level. Well, it turns out that that retail space is also some of the most valuable in the world. Here we have um, retail rents ranked around the world and Causeway Bay in Hong Kong is even more expensive than the, uh, the boulevards of Fifth Avenue, Champs-Elysees in Paris, Ginza in Tokyo. And when we're talking about less dense cities like Honolulu or Spartanburg, South Carolina, we're talking about a gigantic difference. Now, obviously not everything can be measured in dollars and cents. What we should also be measuring are the tangible factors of a human habitat. And here's one of them. Despite being an extremely overcrowded and highly polluted city, Hong Kong surpassed Japan several years ago for having the highest life expectancy in the world. And indeed, three out of the top five jurisdictions in the world rankings are three of the world's most dense jurisdictions. That was also true, of course, um, in the retail space and the housing costs. Density produces many benefits. We're all concerned about climate change and we received a number of questions about climate change earlier today. It turns out that the carbon emissions per person in Hong Kong rank only 44th in the world behind jurisdictions like New Zealand that we think of as far more environmentally friendly than Hong Kong. And again, that's a direct result of the lack of car commuting 
and the highly dense conditions of the city of Hong Kong. Now, one of the persistent myths that we have in America is that highly dense urban environments are unsafe. And let me just show you this urban environment. This is a district of Hong Kong known as Mong Kok. Mong Kok is not far from the neighborhoods that I showed earlier. It is, um, by some measures, the single densest neighborhood in Hong Kong. You can clearly see that this street is for pedestrians. You can clearly see that people are not primarily using the roadways for commuting in their automobiles. But what you might not be able to see is that this is the notorious capital of organized crime in Hong Kong. It is famous or infamous, I should say, for loan sharking, gambling dens, everything that you would associate with organized crime. And for those of you cinema buffs out there, you'll know that no Hong Kong gangster film is complete without a shootout in Mong Kok. But as you saw, Mong Kok is also the site of some of Hong Kong's most popular night markets. And in 2019, when I led an in-person delegation to Hong Kong, I made a point of bringing our group to Mong Kok to shop in the night markets. And when everyone got back on the bus, I asked, did you feel unsafe? People, it didn't even occur to them to feel unsafe. They felt entirely safe in Mong Kok. Well, it's easy to see why. In a neighborhood like this, if your purse gets snatched, you could scream and a hundred people would immediately turn around to see what was going on. And the thief would not be able to get away. That's what makes it safe. And we don't have to go all the way to Mong Kok in Hong Kong. Right here in Waikiki, Honolulu, we can see the exact same principle in action. There are so many people on the street on Kalakaua Avenue at all hours of day and night. And as a result, if say you're an elderly person, retired person from a foreign country, maybe you don't speak any English at all, you would still be comfortable walking down the street at midnight because there are so many people around. Even though Waikiki might very well be one of the highest crime districts of Hawaii, people feel extremely safe when there are lots of other people around. And you know what? These are principles that stretch all the way back to the beginning of human habitation. This is the famous city of Pompeii, Italy, where due to a volcanic eruption, the grid layout of the city was preserved very much intact and it's easy for us to see today, historians, what that city looked like during the Roman Empire 2000 years ago. And again, we can see all of those principles in action, high density, ground floor retail, no setbacks, narrow streets and sidewalks. Here's a zoom in close up of what those streets in Pompeii looked like. You can see just how narrow those streets and sidewalks were. Those principles existed around the world for thousands of years in civilization after civilization. Here is a somewhat more modern reinterpretation. By the way, this is Dubrovnik, which of course at one point was part of the Roman Empire. You can see just how closely this resembles that pattern in Pompeii. But let's go to some more you know, uh, far-flung locations. Here we have the ancient city of Jado in Niger. Again, we see the high density we see the extremely narrow streets and sidewalks very clearly. We see the ancient metropolis of Shibam in Yemen. Um, again, the same principles in action wherever we go around the world. Cities were built like this in many different civilizations. We didn't need the Harvard Graduate School of Design to teach us how to build our cities until one thing happened. And it was the Industrial Revolution, where we saw a couple of phenomena take place together. One was a dramatic increase in pollution from factories. They started emitting air pollution. They started dumping toxic materials into our waterways. 
and that made environments very, very polluted. Here, we have um, a little bit of an illustration of a side effect of the factories being developed in urban agglomerations, which was that workers flooded into the cities from the countryside to take jobs in these factories. And suddenly you started to see very, very overcrowded, cramped living conditions in the cities. As a result, we had poor hygiene, we had very poor sanitation facilities, we had people breathing in extremely polluted air. Um, and these two factors of high pollution and a severe housing shortage combined to create a situation that was just outrageous and just shocking. And that's when the urban planning profession really started to get off the ground. And it was folks like this gentleman here, Sir Ebenezer Howard in England. They, he was so appalled by the conditions in places like London. He wanted to avoid the pitfalls of the urban poverty, the overcrowding, the low wages, the dirty alleys with no drainage, the poor ventilation, the toxic substances and dust and gases, the epidemics of infectious disease and the lack of interaction with nature. And he proposed this. This is the so-called garden city. And in his books, he advocated for slumless, smokeless cities that would offer the benefits of both town living, but also the countryside. And you can clearly see from this diagram that by surrounding urban settlements with parks, with forests, he was hoping to dissipate some of the worst effects of the Industrial Revolution on the overcrowded slums that characterized cities like London. His ideas were very popular and they gained further support from this gentleman here, a European urban planner and architect named Le Corbusier, who designed this model here of the radiant city. And he took the garden city one step further by surrounding each individual tower with greenery, with park, with open space. And certainly he was the most progressive, most innovative urban planner of his time. Even though he personally didn't get a lot of commissions, this idea of the tower in the park was very widely adopted. Um, and, you know, here we had a total environment that was totally set up for success. The most modern thinking, the most innovative technology and ideas, the most acclaimed and celebrated architects from around the world, a commitment to high density, to alleviating the housing shortage that occurred in the post-war baby boom. And armed with these ideas and all of this energy, this is what happened. The most innovative and technically advanced housing settlements built in the world to date. This is the famous pruitt Igo housing project in St. Louis, Missouri. It was designed by one of the most celebrated architects of his day, Minoru Yamasaki, who went on to design the World Trade Centers. It was built during an unprecedented infusion of federal funds into housing development um, during the middle of the 20th century. That was followed up by even more federal funding during the Great Society era under the presidency of Lyndon Johnson. And what happened? Well, we know what happened. A lot of negative consequences, crime, drugs, organized crime, cyclical poverty. I have met very few, if any, political figures, even on the far left, who would say that the housing projects of the middle part of the 20th century were a success. And the usual reason given is the concentration of poverty. And I would say, well, the concentration of poverty was certainly a factor, but it couldn't have been the only factor because if you look at those towers in Kowloon that I showed earlier, those were not rich people either. A lot of those folks were refugees from the revolutions and the wars and the unrest of mainland China. And they crowded into some pretty tenement-like conditions in Hong Kong. To me, the difference is those ancient principles that we've already discussed. High density, but not just high density, ground floor retail, 
no setbacks, narrow streets and sidewalks. You can clearly see here in Pruitt Igo, we did not have ground floor retail. There were huge setbacks and the streets and sidewalks were capacious. They were very large. You can see more of that towers in a park type of design at Hawaii's largest um, housing project, public housing project. This is Kuhio Park Terrace. Again, no ground floor retail, huge setbacks, um, and the streets and sidewalks are very large. Um, and KPT in Hawaii certainly has the same, you know, negative stigma that a lot of the housing projects around this country have had. What you might not know for KPT is actually there are rooftop swimming pools here at KPT. Again, these projects were built with the best of intentions by the most modern and progressive thinkers. And indeed, those um, ideas that were championed by Le Corbusier and achieved their uh, expression in American public housing have been continued to become very popular. This is the largest Hong Kong housing development of all time. It's the Lohas Park development. It's on 86 acres of former landfill, 50 towers, 25,000 housing units. But this looks very much like a towers in a park type of environment to me. You probably have two thirds or three quarters of this footprint of this land taken up by open space. And you can imagine that there is not going to be the same level of ground level vitality that we see in those congested streets of Kowloon that we saw earlier. It is, it is a fact that the desire for open space that uh, is, is very persistent in not just Hawaii, but around the world today. Almost universally, the feedback that is given to folks um, who are planning dense urban environments is that we need more green space, we need more open space, we need more healthful environments. And that's true all over the world. Now, I've explained the principles and the rules that I believe are universal, but I think that there's no more eloquent or certainly no more spicy refutation of demands like this than Jane Jacobs, who is a very famous figure in American urban planning. She led the opposition to a famous developer named Robert Moses, who wanted to demolish a lot of the historic neighborhoods of New York City, replacing them with towers in a park and with super highways. And when he came for Jane Jacobs' beloved home neighborhood of Greenwich Village, she wrote this book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And I reproduced the exact pages in her book because it's almost unbelievable how outside the mainstream her words would seem even today. As a woman in Indiana said, when asked if she liked the town square, nobody there but dirty old men who spit tobacco juice and try to look up your skirt. Now these are direct quotes. In orthodox city planning, neighborhood open spaces are venerated in an amazingly uncritical fashion. Ask a Hauser how his planned neighborhood improves on the old city and he will cite as a self-evident virtue more open space. Walk with a planner through a dispirited neighborhood and though it be already scabby with deserted parks and tired landscaping festooned with old Kleenex, he will envision a future of more open space. More open space for what? For muggings, for bleak vacuums between buildings or for ordinary people to use and enjoy. People do not use city open space just because it is there and just because city planners or designers wish they would. Open spaces are complex things. There is a balance between too much, not enough, and just right. Let's take a look at some real world examples here. This is Singapore. And in Singapore, they took the garden city quite literally and began to surround all of their buildings with a lot of greenery. 
Now, while Singapore is one of the safer cities in the world, you can see that there's not a lot of pedestrian interaction here because you don't have this, uh, you have huge setbacks, you don't have the narrow streets and sidewalks, and you don't have the ground floor retail. Here's another illustration. In this one with the extremely wide street, the cars are gonna be driving so fast, say 40 or even 50 miles an hour, that if they jump the curb, a pedestrian would be dead meat. And therefore pedestrians don't feel safe walking down streets like this. We don't have to go all the way to Singapore. Here's an example here in Hawaii. This is a future, a rendering of the future Ward Village, Oahe Street. And perhaps to attract the support of neighboring organizations, they've really designed this rendering to look as much like towers in a park as possible. And let me show you what effect that has. Um, what you have is that you really reduce pedestrian traffic. And again, this is Oahe Street. This photo is a modern photo. Um, this exists today. For those of you in Hawaii, you'll be familiar with where I am standing while I am taking this photo. I am standing at the Ward Theater block, which is certainly one of the most heavily pedestrian trafficked blocks in the entire state. And just across the street, which as we already discussed is too wide, you see a strip of greenery, the setback. You even see a grade separation, a podium, which was put there due to concerns about flooding due to climate change. But the problem is once you raise the building by several feet, it's only accessible by that ramp that you see in the middle of the screen and also by other stairs that you don't see off to the side. And you don't get that same level of pedestrian penetration. It's not so easy to walk onto that sidewalk into that retail space, which as you might know, is a restaurant that has since shut down. So you can see that even just across the street, you can go from having an extremely busy pedestrian space to one that has very little pedestrian traffic. And it is all because we have a lack of the four ancient principles, the four rules of high density, but also ground floor retail, no setbacks and narrow streets and sidewalks. Let me bring it back to the whole reason why we are talking about urban density. It is not for its own sake, even though, as I've already mentioned, I believe urban density brings about a number of health benefits, of economic benefits, of environmental benefits. At the end of the day, the outcry, the voice of the people is clear. People love our existing single family communities that are quiet and peaceful like Aina Haina. Our farms cultivating crops that we all need, like sunflowers to make oil and biodiesel. People love the majestic vistas of our mountain ranges and their unspoiled, pristine forests. The recreational opportunities afforded by our uncrowded beaches. People love our parks, our gardens that are historic in nature, that offer tranquility and restoration of the soul, our historic places that give us a reminder of where we came from and who we are as a people, as a civilization. Indeed, I love these areas. I love this way of life just as much, if not more than everybody else. I am not trying to destroy this way of life. What I am saying is on the contrary, we must preserve every inch of existing single family neighborhoods, of existing open spaces, of parks, of agriculture. That is what the people want. That is what the people love about living Hawaii. And the way to do that is by taking a very small limited number of state parcels near the rail lines and developing them with very high density, with ground floor retail, with no setbacks, and with narrow streets and sidewalks. These four rules, when applied, allow us to have our cake and to eat it too, 
to enjoy the high quality of life of a five minute walk to everything, long lifespans, low carbon emissions, minimal environmental impact, minimal impact to traffic, while preserving everything else for the end of time, our existing residential communities, our natural and wild spaces. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Um, I am always happy to take questions and to interact with you. Um, I know we have a little bit of time until our next presentation. And so um, I would be happy to take questions today. And of course, if we are not able to get to your question today, you can feel free to reach out and let us know at any time if you have any other thoughts, questions, or feedback. All right, Evan, do we have any questions? Yes, thank you, Senator. Uh, we do have quite a few questions for you. Uh, the first one we'll start with is from Herbert Schreiner, uh, who asks about Kaka'ako, uh, which is a relatively dense area for Hawaii that is going up, and but the prices are still ridiculous. He asks, what's going to be done about foreign investment and that causing the prices to rise in these dense areas that you advocate for? That's a great question. And um, the answer is that I think the government should take a very active role in developing public, aka social housing, that is priced just enough to be revenue neutral, but very low. A recent state study said that it was possible to build a two bedroom condo unit and sell it for only $400,000 per unit. I believe that the public sector needs to take the lead on building communities that are affordable and accessible to everybody, regardless of income and building enough to meet demand so that everybody who wants one can have one so that billionaires and formerly homeless people can live side by side. Now, this, if this sounds familiar to you, this is the model that is used in Singapore. If this sounds familiar to you in Hawaii, this is the so-called Aloha Homes model, affordable locally owned homes for all model that I've been advocating and fighting for at the legislature for the past four years. Now, to get to the idea of wealthy overseas investors in particular, I've been very clear and very adamant that these homes would only be available to people who meet a three-part strict test. They must be Hawaii residents, they must own no other real property, and they must be owner occupants. So by definition, they could not be wealthy overseas investors. Every single one of those new public housing units would be occupied by a local family. Now, conversely, what I also believe is that we should be less exacting. We should uh, not rely on the private sector to solve all of our housing issues. A lot of our current strategies today, like inclusionary zoning, which means requiring a certain percentage of all the units in a new development to be sold at below market prices. You know, I, I compare that, it's a little bit like telling a private school, forcing a private school that they have to offer scholarships to lower income students who can't afford the tuition. And that's fine, but we all know that that wouldn't solve the problem of education. What we really need to do is create public school, a large scale mass option that is available to everybody, both the rich and the poor, and to provide as much as is needed. Now, one of the things that I find quite remarkable that maybe does not seem so remarkable to everyone else is the fact that even during the worst economic crisis in generations here in Hawaii, at the height of the pandemic, even when people were proposing a 20% furlough one day off a week for our public school teachers, not one person proposed, you know what, what we should do to make our ends meet at the Department of Education with drastically decreased tax revenue is to say no more students in our public schools who are over 140% of the area median income. We had a commitment, even at the bottom of the pandemic, to educating in our public schools everyone, regardless of income. And that is the same commitment that I believe can and should exist for housing 
And that does exist in Singapore. It does exist in Vienna. It can exist here in Hawaii as well. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question uh, is asked by multiple people, uh, but it's generally asking about what your thoughts on the population decline. Uh, asking, is it contrary to say that we still need to grow at this rate of 16 or 17,000 acres per decade if we are also in population decline? That's a really good question, and, and I, I should have been more clear. So um, I'm going to make a few different points here. Um, the first point that I mentioned is that our population is still increasing just based on th the fact that there are more local births than there are local deaths. People are still having more babies than elderly people or all people are dying in Hawaii. So just the natural population increase should still happen. About 18,000 babies on average are born in Hawaii every year, and about 11,000 people die in Hawaii every year. So the population is naturally increasing. And I firmly believe that we have a moral obligation to house those people who are born and raised in Hawaii. Generations of local people who are born and raised here, every future generation should be able to live in Hawaii if they so choose. The sad reality is because our housing production has not kept pace, people have been forced to leave. And so that's why we've hit that critical turning point. Even though we are still having more babies than there are local people dying here in Hawaii, the high cost of housing is forcing people to seek employment and housing elsewhere. And that's why we have a population decline. It's not a natural population decline. It's an artificial population decline. Or more precisely, it is one that we have shot ourselves in the foot with. We have inflicted upon ourselves. My fear is that once that population decline takes hold, that we are now going to enter a spiral, a downward spiral, a spiral in which our local people have to leave, where the only people who can move in are those who are very rich, who can afford the million plus dollar median home prices in the three of the four counties of Hawaii, that lo we lose our local culture, we lose that sense of what makes Hawaii special. And instead, what we have is a replacement by an entirely new outside force. I want to remind everyone here. Now, in America, we always tend to assume population increase. Okay, certainly that's been the case in Hawaii for since statehood, if not even before. But there are many jurisdictions in the United States that do face population decline. We can think of Detroit. We can think of the Rust Belt cities. We can think of rural areas in states across the Midwest. We can think of entire countries like Japan, like South Korea. We can think of much of uh, Western and Eastern Europe. In none of these places do they think population decline is a good thing. If you go to a place like Japan, they believe their population decline is an existential threat to their civilization. And indeed in Japan, they don't believe that one can simply assimilate if you're not born with, you know, in the Japanese uh, ethnicity that civilization will cease to exist if their population birth rates continue. And so while in America, we continue to project optimism and growth, and we believe that growth is inevitable, both economically and population wise, the sad reality is that Hawaii can become and is becoming a Rust Belt type community that is in decline. Now we have the power to change that fate. Unlike communities where you know, the one factory, the one employer in town closed, in Hawaii, all we need to do is to build more housing to accommodate the local people who wish to live here and to prevent the mass exodus of local people. That's all we need to do. So again, we can have our cake and eat it too. 
we can have a population increase, we can preserve our local culture, we can preserve the affordability by just building more at a very high density following the four rules, and we can preserve our natural environment. So um, while I'm not saying that population decline per se is a negative thing, I think it is a clear symptom and a clear black and white indication that the current path we are on is unsustainable. Thanks, Senator. Um, one more question we have uh, mentions that if we limit social housing to only dense areas, uh, but we leave single family zoned urban areas alone, but that may increase economic or racial segregation. Uh, but if we look at places like Vienna, where social housing is on the same streets as multi million dollar villas, um, shouldn't we be adding more social housing to both of these areas in order to avoid these issues of segregation? That's my kind of question. Um, the answer is yes. But I recognize that people are very attached to their physical surroundings. It's called place attachment. Okay, recently in the Kailua neighborhood, an area with a severe shortage of affordable housing, as those of you who are familiar with Oahu know, um, there was proposed a 74 unit project. It was entirely affordable. It was four stories tall. And the community showed up in force and they argued that even though it was next to an auto parts store and a gas station in a commercial section of the town, and even though it was only four stories, which is not a terribly tall building, it was completely out of character with the surroundings of Kailua. And they made clear in no uncertain terms that that was unacceptable. And their political leaders reacted by ending that project in its tracks. So, while in some future world, we might be able to get to the point of Vienna where we would be able to, you know, redevelop existing residential neighborhoods and, you know, existing neighborhoods, I don't foresee that happening in the immediate future. And if indeed the people of Hawaii insist that they want, that we want to preserve our single family neighborhoods, that we need to fossilize them in amber until the rest of time, then, you know, um, the good news is that we can build really high quality public and social housing like that in Vienna, um, which we're going to hear about, um, you know, a little bit later. Now, the the thing about, you know, the thing about Vienna and the thing about Singapore, for that matter, is that these systems did not arise overnight. Vienna has been building large scale public housing since 1920. Singapore since the 1960s, really. And they've had years for this abundance mentality to take root, for the scarcity mentality of every new Kakaako luxury penthouse is snatching a unit out of the hands of a needy local and even Hawaiian family. And instead to have the abundance mentality of there's enough housing for everybody, just the way we in Hawaii would say there's enough public school spots for everybody. Um, to talk a little bit more about residential segregation and Hawaii, you know, um, Hawaii does not have the same dynamics that exist in terms of residential segregation on the mainland. We certainly do have our own dynamics, um, but it's not the same. And so I don't necessarily foresee, although we might, it might develop, um, I would say that the demand for new affordable housing is across all racial and ethnic lines. I would say that East Asians, I would say that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, I would say that Caucasian individuals, there is a demand across all racial and ethnic groups for new affordable housing. And um, that being said, in terms of residential integration, um, you do have examples like Singapore where they have strict quotas, not just by the project, not just by the individual building, but even the individual floor, a certain percentage of each of the units on a floor of a tower should be for uh, ethnically Chinese, ethnically Malays, and ethnic Indian and other families. So, um, you know, that's a little bit heavy handed, um, but it is possible because of course it is a government run um, housing development. And will we need that in Hawaii? I'm not 100% convinced yet, but we may in the future and that's fine too. Um, that is a possibility. It's been done before and it's been successful in Singapore. So that's not an insurmountable challenge to overcome. Uh, 
Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, one of them comes from Ian Ross. He says, Aloha, Senator. He's the chair of the Makiki Neighborhood Board. Uh, that much of Makiki is quite dense by current Honolulu standards. And so he's asking, how would your vision affect our area? And would we be looking at replacing existing high-rise housing in Makiki or anywhere on the island with greater density? Or would we be leaving them aside for now? So um, the answer is we would be leaving them to the side for now. I want to be clear that our my proposal, the Aloha Homes proposal, is limited strictly to state-owned lands near rail stations, such as Aloha Stadium, the OCCC prison, to name just two examples that are already slated for redevelopment. So assuming that those apartment towers in Makiki are privately owned, which they are, they would not be affected anytime in the foreseeable future. And for those already living in existing dense environments like Makiki, like Waikiki, like Mo'ili'ili, you know, I would say before we start looking at densifying those communities, we, you know, those are already congested. There's already a lot of traffic. There's already a lot of noise. I think the state should really focus on limiting traffic, limiting noise, limiting congestion, um, and preserving, you know, the best parts of those communities and maybe enhancing them, investing further in their maintenance and their upkeep and their infrastructure and instead focus on new communities where the state does have the land and the blank slate to create communities that follow the four rules of urban density and that would be successful and that you know, could be created from scratch um, where we wouldn't need to displace you know, existing residents um, who may be lower income or even higher income where we wouldn't need to impact those existing residents. So um, again, we can have our cake and we can eat it too. Okay, we have a question from Thomas Brandt, uh, who asked, how would a previously homeless person possibly qualify financially to buy a $400,000 home, uh, I believe under the Aloha Homes proposal? That's a great question. And in communities with abundant, successful public housing um, programs, such as Singapore and Vienna, homelessness while it exists is a much, much, much smaller problem than it is in high cost housing shortage jurisdictions like Oahu, like California. And the reason is because existing assistance programs are currently being stretched way too thin. If we build high density Aloha homes for everybody who would like one, who can afford a $400,000 home, then a lot of those people would no longer be burdens, or would no longer be drawing, for example, Section 8 and other assistance programs. They would be living in their own Aloha home, which would be, again, revenue neutral to the taxpayer. So there would be no taxpayer additional burden. So um, to, to throw a few more statistics at you, about it's estimated that existing housing assistance programs, such as the Section 8 housing voucher program, they assist only about one fifth of all those who need it. The vast majority of people who qualify for Section 8 do not get it. Um, and so as a result, there's a lot of people who might be able to afford a $400,000 condo, but who cannot afford a million dollar median priced home who are in those assistance programs. If we build $400,000 homes, which under existing federal programs would be um, available to buy for only a $12,000 down payment and a median home price on, uh, would that, according to the federal government, would be available, would be affordable to a family of four making less than 60% of the area median income, which is quite low, which in, includes the vast majority of the people of Hawaii. As those people move out of their overcrowded housing conditions, they come off the government assistance programs, they leave their, they make vacant their existing rental housing programs, then the uh, government assistance and the existing rental housing programs will become available to those who truly need it the most, such as those who are currently homeless. And that's exactly what happens in Singapore today, where in Singapore, speaking of intermixing of populations, they have actually taken the, um, they've actually taken 
uh, formerly homeless folks, they give them subsidies in the government from the government, and they house them in the same public housing projects that middle and even higher income individuals live in side by side. So um, you have people like the current president of Singapore, she actually lived in public housing, you know, side by side near some, you know, relatively low income people until she was forced to move into the presidential palace for security reasons. And so, um, you know, um, we could adopt that exact same model here in Hawaii. All right, and probably for our last question, uh, someone is wondering, what, what does you envision the role of community engagement in the process of trying to build a higher density Oahu or higher density parts of Oahu? Yeah, you know, community engagement is so critical. Community engagement is, um, is such an important concept um, because as I think we all can relate to, if suddenly someone makes a huge change in our lives with no notice, without hearing our voices as part of the conversation, there's a natural human psychological tendency to say, wait a second, um, I'm not okay with this. I need to be consulted. So I would say community engagement um, should start from day one, even before day one, even before a project is proposed and should continue, you know, all the way up until the project is actually proposed and should continue even after a project is proposed and should continue after even if, even after the project is built. I'll give you a concrete example. I've been talking about Aloha Stadium and OCCC for years now, and I've mentioned them multiple times in this presentation. Now, I am certainly not making it a secret that I believe that the highest and best use of community of those two state parcels would be high density housing. Now, you know, I could I do a better job of going into those individual communities and saying that uh, certainly, um, and. Part of that effort is by convening conferences like this one to talk to those who are engaged, who are the thought leaders, like the audience members, like you folks here, about these ideas on a big picture basis. Because you know, I might not get my way. It might not be Aloha Stadium. It might not be O Triple C. It might be you know some totally different parcel of land. But we need to introduce these ideas early and often. And so that's why 1,000 homes per acre is the title of our housing conference. That's why. We're having a housing conference at all that we've invited the public to that I've tried to publicize as broadly as I know how um, that you know we've invited people to from social media, we, you know it's completely free it's accessible to anyone in the world via an internet connection. We're going to be uh, making these recordings as available as we can after the fact. Um, but we also need to have people at the table with a voice who have historically been voices against densification of communities. And that's why later today at 1115, we'll be hearing from three uh, folks, Chun James, Susan Kirsch, and Ronnie Wami, who have been um, very vocal uh, critics and um, have, who have engaged in a lot of critical thinking of projects that have been proposed, of various proposals. And I don't mean to say that they're critical. These are members of the community who represent thousands, if not millions of voices. And their criticisms, their um, concerns about different projects, their viewpoints are extremely crucial for those of us who are pro-housing and pro-growth to understand. Because if we don't understand those concerns and if we don't understand those voices, then we are going to be walking into the same exact traps that communities and governments and politicians and developers have walked into for decades and for generations that have clearly failed, that have not just not solved, but produced the housing shortage that we are in today. You know, So when the government in the past has said we should build infrastructure for free and then allow private developers to build private homes on top of that land, like at Kaka'ako, I think we need to learn lessons from that because as was already mentioned, nobody I know has said what we really need around here are 10 more Kaka'akos. That's certainly not what the people of Hawaii have made clear by public opinion. And so we need to learn from those lessons. We need to learn from that public sentiment and we need to give people what they want, which I believe, you know, 
is to limit impacts to existing communities to the greatest extent possible, which is why our Aloha Homes proposal is to surgically affect very small parcels in a very small number of communities so that the entire state's housing shortage can be alleviated and that the sons and daughters and children and grandchildren and every future generation of all our communities, including our single family communities, will be able to find a place here in Hawaii. And so um, on that note, I really appreciate everyone's time. I know everyone's busy and everyone has Zoom fatigue, but I really appreciate that everyone took the time out of their day to participate in today's uh, important conversations. Thank you so much, Evan, for being a great moderator.